What's up, y'all? Hey, look, I'm a little bit sick, so we're not going to have a full-on live stream. But I am happy to come with my very white voice and talk about, ooh, get it together. Anytime I get sick, I do that very white voice, and I tell you to get it together, baby. Anyway, getting in a more serious tone, we want to talk about uh, a few of the other articles that I didn't get to and the more recent Ten Commandments of Climate issue in regard to uh, Francis, as well as um, this relationship, the special relationship we could say that forms between the Western power elite and the Vatican in the 20th century, especially. And as we saw in the last live stream, that went back to pretty much the um, Benedict the 15th, the time of the League of Nations. And it really culminated uh, at the time of Vatican II in regard to John Courtney Murray, C.D. Jackson, Time Life Magazine and the CIA's Doctrinal Warfare Program to have an important role at uh, Vatican II to promote Americanism. So ecumenism uh, is part and parcel with Americanism because uh, it's basically the commodification of religion. Uh, There's an older article that's really good at um, Mama Jones, Mother Jones's, uh, from back in the early 80s, like 1982 or three. And it gets into some of the history of uh, that I didn't get to <clears throat> in regard to the, the forming of this special relationship between the OSS and CIA and the Vatican. And this, as we said, was what led to a lot of the connections to the Vatican bank scandals, the money laundering to, uh, to fund black operations. Often the CIA and the government, like the Vatican, will interact in major ways through one person, such as the case with uh, Mikhail Sindona. Sedona rose from peasant roots in Sicily to become one of the most important and influential bankers in the Western world. This is just another data point that connects what we talked about yesterday. At the height of his power, Sedona lorded over a financial empire that stretched from Rome to Hollywood and included the largest banks of Switzerland. He controlled hundreds of corporations and counted among his most <coughs> his partners such influential allies as David Kennedy, Treasury Secretary under Nixon, Archbishop Marcinkus, President of the Vatican Bank, as well as other drug banks. Marcinkus is currently dodging the Italian police. This was written in, the, uh, in 1982, so keep that in mind. In regard to his role in the collapse of the Banco d'Ambrosio, Italy's largest private bank. This is Archbishop Marcinkus, by the way. The Vatican's, uh, the head of the Vatican, the guy who was appointed as the head of the Vatican Bank in the 70s and 80s. Described by a former colleague as a snake charmer, Sindona had a knack for making the right connections. In the 1950s, he befriended Giovanni Montini. The Archbishop of Milan. <clears throat> yeah, you may have heard of him. <laughs> Whose esteem for Sendona was clinched when the banker donated $2 million to the church for an old uh, people's home. Luigi De Fonza, in his recently released book, St. Peter's Banker, suggests the money which Sendona uh, raised in a single day was provided by the CIA operatives stationed in Milan. Some years later, Montini became Pope. So there you go. And he brought on Sindona to manage the Vatican's immense financial portfolio. Paul Williams also notes that Paul VI worked together closely with uh, the OSS, by the way. One of the world's, world's most uh, greatest fiscal powers, this sovereign mini-state of 109 anchors, acres had investments in every sector of the Italian economy as well as abroad. But what appealed to Sindona most of all was the Vatican was the excessive sec- was its excessive secrecy associated with this multi-billion dollar banking arm the institute of the operation uh, uh, the institute of religious works because the vatican is not subject to the stringent currency regulations this is exactly what william said the vatican bank is able to move huge sums of money in terms of international money markets <coughs> while leading a uh, while eluding auditors and the, and the like. In effect, this operates as a fiscal twilight zone, immune to outsider interference in a manner similar to in an offshore bank. God's banker, Sindona, was known because of his close association with the Vatican. He was the top financier also for the mafia, laundering drug profits with the Gambino brothers as well as the Sicilian counterparts. At the same time, he functioned as a financial conduit for numerous CIA operations. So this is a crucial article. And then it goes into uh, the Greek Revolution in 1967. He later channeled uh, millions of CIA dollars to centrist right-wing political parties, including Christian Democrats, 
During his heyday as a CIA operative, Sedona was paymaster to the P2 Lodge, the most secretive cell of Italian Freemasonry led by Grand Master Licio Galli, a diehard Mussolini supporter. Galli and the P2 members were called uh, and implicated in a series of financial political scandals that rocked Italy for many years. So uh, while many of you might be right-wingers who think this is uh, super cool and based, you understand this is all gigantic organized crime black markets and money laundering. So these are a bunch of scam artists. They're not based trad people. Anyway, this uh, article goes on to talk about um, more of these uh, in-depth connections, which uh, I detailed in yesterday's show. So I'm not going to read all of that. But <clears throat> um, the same author has another really good article uh, going back to Bill Donovan and the OSS and <clears throat> the relationship between the Vatican and the OSS as well. It's called uh, There Will Be Done. Um and it referred and it relates to uh, tracking this special relationship from the time of Bill Donovan, uh, of course, who, who was a, a supposed trad cat, all the way up into uh, the modern period of and, and the, the papacy of uh, John Paul II, as well as the some of the orders like the Knights of Malta that you heard me talk about in yesterday's show. So <clears throat> I'm just trying to illustrate for you guys that all the stuff that you hear me talk about is not really theory. This is just older uh, classic journalism that's been discussed for a long time. And this helps us understand how we got up to the present day in terms of the Vatican uh, being uh, intimately connected with the global power structure and essentially being uh, co-opted into doing the bidding of this same power structure thus we have the papacy supporting all the green agenda the cop 27 agenda the 10 commandments of climate in francis's encyclical inclusive capitalism which uh, francis is a big part of so we're going to look at that next the inclusive capitalism which is covered in the cnbc uh video here is of capitalism announcing a new partnership between the pope the vatican and business leaders across the globe. It follows a meeting just over a year ago in which the Pope Francis called for the urgent need for an economic system that is fair, trustworthy, and capable of addressing the most profound challenges facing humanity. Executives are now committing to the Council's pledge to create a more sustainable and equitable system. They include Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, Johnson & Johnson CEO Alex Gorski, CalPERS CEO Marcy Frost, and Merck CEO Ken Frazier. Joining us right now is the founder of that council, Lynn Forster de Rothschild. Uh, Lynn, good morning to you. Uh, you are the brain uh, brain child of this idea. So there you note that all of the same people that pushed the Great Reset, uh, these executives, are part and parcel with Francis's support of the exact same agenda for, quote, inclusive capitalism. And then I would note, too, that it doesn't stop there. This goes into other arenas like the creation of this proto-world religion movement, which is the uh, Abrahamic Faith Center. Anybody who knows anything about historic Christianity at all would know that Islam and Christianity do not have the same faith. They don't even have a common heritage in the sense of the same God because the God of the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus, according to Jesus in John 5, 6, 7, and 8. This is a crucial argument that Jesus makes to the Pharisees. So the idea that there's some common generic Unitarianism that we share with Jews and Muslims is not true. And anybody who knows Orthodox Trinitarian theology knows that 100%. But you'll notice that the Vatican has no problem creating a gigantic Abrahamic faith center together with these world religions, which are not our religion. Cultures and faiths. A beacon of religious coexistence is planned for the capital Abu Dhabi called the Abrahamic Family House. Rebecca McLaughlin Instam looks into what it really means from Jewish, Christian, and Muslim representatives in the region. Take a look. Religious history was made in Abu Dhabi last year when the document on human fraternity was signed by Pope Francis and Dr. Ahmed Al Tayeb, the Grand Imam of Al Azhar. Now that document, if you if you remember, uh, promoted the idea that God positively wills all of the world religions. So, in other words, all the heresies, all the satanic cults, 
all the demonic religions that exist that literally worship demons like Hinduism and so forth, God actively, positively wills those things. So it's not just the idea of God's providence permitting these things, but it's that God actually wills these things. And that's because the real religion of the Vatican, especially after the Vatican II document, Nostra Aetate, is perennialism. The idea that the world religions are all kind of pointing to the same supra structure super religion which is a lowest common denominator faith between the so-called abrahamic faiths but of course that is not the orthodox view that's not the trinitarian view and that's certainly not what jesus says in the gospel of john tolerance universal peace and the reconciliation of all faiths embodying this agreement this year construction will start on a project called the abrahamic family house on sadiat island Due for completion in 2022, the site will house a church, a mosque, and a synagogue. Award-winning Ghanaian British architect Sir David Ajay, who is spearheading the project, says he was profoundly honored and humbled to receive the commission. And having identified limestone, timber, and bronze as classical materials used in all... So you'll notice that this has nothing to do with historic Christianity, right? Um... I'll show you that this is supported by the Vatican. So here's Vatican News. And you'll notice that they support the Vatican Faith Center. And this was based on the common fraternity shared between the Pope and the Grand Imam. So this is really the surrendering of the Christian religion as a whole, which, of course, as Orthodox, we have said for centuries that the Vatican... Uh, not just at Vatican II, but about a thousand years ago, surrendered the uh, Christian faith, particularly when it came to the insertion of the doctrine of the Filioque, which led to the ideas of created grace. It led to the, re the ideas of the Renaissance and the paganizing of the church in terms of the art and architecture. And that led to further heresies such as Dictatus Pape and the rise of the medieval geopolitical power of the papacy so you can see that the last three days of lectures uh, tie all of this together perfectly if you enjoyed this video be sure and take use of the promo code for the show sponsor for this channel sponsor which is chalk.com that's chok.com you can find the links in the description below the video, you get 50% off any of the great organic, actually better than organic supplements that they offer at chalk.com. If you want to support my channel, the best way to do that is to head on over there and use that promo code J50, that's J50, to get 50% off. You can also use the recurring subscription of J53LIFE, that's J53LIFE, if you want to sign up for automatic recurring subscriptions on those excellent supplements. Health is absolutely necessary in combating the toxic culture that we live in. I also would say if you want to get access to my books, head on over to the shop at my website and get signed copies there. Thank you. All that it doesn't stop with the notion of a common faith with the Muslims and the Jews, as we're going to see in a minute. This also extends to the idea of a common world religion overall and even the participation of the Pope in prayers at mosques facing towards Mecca. And so this happened uh, no, uh, notoriously famously with Benedict, as you can see. Uh, Benedict uh, did this many about seven years ago when he went to the, uh, the Blue Mosque and uh, intentionally prayed with the Muslims towards Mecca. And if you read the document Mortalium Animos, it says that this is an, a surrendering of the Christian faith. This is an action of apostasy. In Catholic moral theology, the interior disposition is displayed by the exterior actions. And so to do public actions where you revere the religious symbology and heart of another religion is itself a surrendering of the Christian faith. To, to do an action of apostasy means that you surrender the Christian faith. That's Catholic theology. That's Catholic canon law. And the same thing was done by Francis as well. He went to the Blue Mosque, prayed together with the Muslims towards Mecca. And for uh, Catholics to, to try to explain this away as, oh, well, he's privately praying to Jesus is absurd. 
Imagine if I were to go into a satanic temple and stand before the altar of Baphomet and when people ask me about it, oh, later I say I'm praying to, I was secretly praying to Jesus. It doesn't matter because the action, the, the, the external action in the public sphere is an action of apostasy and it causes grave scandal and it gives the impression that I have surrendered my Christian faith, you see. So here you see that the uh, head of the Christian religion, according to the Roman Catholics, has clearly defected from the Christian faith. In fact, in the canons of the first seven councils, this is an offense that automatically would excommunicate a person from the church. And here you see the papacy engaging in these actions that shows that they do not have the Christian faith. And it's not new to Francis. This goes back to the time of John Paul II. And yes, it occurred uh, also with uh, so-called Orthodox leaders who also participated in the prayer services together with the other world religions. You can see the Dalai Lama there. You can see the, uh, Arch, the Arch Layman of Canterbury there. You can see uh, other world religions. There were even voodoo practitioners present at the, uh, the service uh, in Assisi in the 1980s. Here you can see inside the church, inside the, the Church of St. Assisi, you have these uh, Buddhist monks. You have voodoo practitioners engaging in all kinds of pagan practices. Here you have more uh, Buddhist monks engaging in the invocation and worshiping of the demonic, literally, uh, inside the Cathedral of Francis of Assisi. And so this is all a, should be a sign and indicator to uh, the the world it's it's now on display and has been for decades especially since Nostra Aetate that the papacy does not have the faith they do not have the belief in the soul media mediation of Christ that uh, you know I'm the way the truth and the life etc all of these public actions according to Mortalium Animos the famous encyclical of 1928 so according to the papacy itself even in 1928 these actions were considered apostasy. And if you've not read Mortalium Animos, you will see that that is the case. And for the uh, Roman Catholics who uh, typically try to explain this away, right, just go read Mortalium Animos. And you will see that in the case of Mortalium Animos, Pius XI in 1928, when he condemns these kinds of actions as apostasy, he's not even talking about other world religions. He's talking about praying with other so-called Christians amongst evangelicals and Anglicans and so forth. So could you imagine what he would have thought of the Pope going and praying in the mosques and bringing uh, voodoo practitioners to practice their religion inside of the uh, CZ Cathedral? But for the Orthodox, this is just part and parcel with the apostasy and the defection of the papacy that occurred a thousand years ago. These also don't end with groups that are just anti-Trinitarian like Muslims or uh, you know, religions that are sort of atheistic or quasi-atheistic like Buddhism. It also gets into uh, practicing and cooperating in a religious public way in services together with religions who are openly uh, Gnostic and even Satanic. For example, uh, Francis went to Iraq and together with the uh, Yazidis who, or, or the Mandeans who are openly still Gnostic, they worship the uh, angel version of Lucifer known as Melek Teos or Shaitan uh, as one of their figures that they worship. And Francis had no problem, uh, according to mainstream news reports, praying together with not just uh, many religions, but also a specifically Gnostic and Satan honoring sect known as the Mandeans. And it's quite obvious in, to anybody who you know is honest and, and can admit what's in their face that none of these actions could be done by a person that actually believes that Jesus is the one true savior and the only way into heaven, right? John 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And certainly nobody in the New Testament. Imagine the time of the martyrs, the first 300 years, right? If it was okay to go and do these kinds of religious ceremonies with the other world religions and the pagan world religions, there would never have been martyrs. Everybody would have just been like, oh, well, I will secretly pray to Jesus while I reverence the statue of Caesar externally. This is all hypocrisy. 
and it is all an, uh, an, a rejection and a defection from the faith. And anybody who's familiar with the Christianity of the first thousand years would know that. And the fact that so many Roman Catholics don't know this and explain it away and ignore it shows that they do not have and do not, they do not in fact have the faith of the first thousand years of Christianity. One last point I would make, which is a needed response to the often repeated Roman Catholic reply, which is they often say that, yeah, but you have Orthodox bishops and priests who engage in a lot of the same kinds of ecumenical activities and who engage in a lot of the same types of climate change uh, propaganda. So you have the same problem. And that's true. But of course, the argument wasn't that we don't have this problem and you do. The argument was that the Roman See has this problem and that signifies a massive defection from the faith, even according to Roman Catholic theology. So for example, you'll, you'll notice that uh, here, in the classic medieval Dictatus Pape, which we covered in the live streams, you'll notice that uh, the Roman See cannot err and has not erred. So that's a statement explicitly referring to uh, the indefectibility of the Roman See and that it will never err all, unto all of eternity even. So in other words, it's the Roman church itself which has defined for itself what the meaning of indefectibility is and how far that indefectibility extends. Thus, if the Pope were to engage in public religious actions together with other false religions, especially the religious actions of reverencing the sites and the symbols of those world religions, that would constitute a defection from the faith. And that's exactly what we have with John Paul II reverencing and kissing the Quran when he was when he was given a, a special uh, version of the Quran, which is a book full of anti-Trinitarian and anti-Christian blasphemies. And it also uh, is signified in an even clearer way by the fact that the Pope since John Paul II went and prayed in the mosques towards Mecca. So you can see these are just examples of clear defections from the faith. And there's no amount of explaining away that changes what's in everybody's face. And it doesn't matter what his motivations or his inner uh, disposition was because the exterior actions display the interior dispositions. From mainstream news, especially places like CNN that get into what Francis's real focus and his real gospel is, it's all social concerns. It's all global governance as, uh, as regards the principles in John the 23rd's Pacham and Terrace. He doesn't teach you the Ten Commandments uh, that are in the Bible. He has a new Ten Commandments around climate change and the green agenda. And this should show you that he's a complete uh, stooge, you could say, of the power elite that runs the Atlantis as the Anglo-American establishment.